this is a, a bit of an unusual kind of event for us. Uh, we tend to do uh, usually lectures, panel discussions, conferences. Occasionally we'll have a film um, on uh, uh, contemporary uh, issues um, and, and discussions uh, that follow. Uh, and this is very much within our mission, which is to use the, uh, the tradition of, of the humanities. Use is not exactly the right word, but to draw upon the, the tradition of the humanities to, to try and illuminate some of the, the fundamental um, social, political, economic, um, and other kinds of questions of, uh, of our age. So it, it's a, a particular delight tonight to actually um, see um, and think about and engage with a performance. Um, and this is a performance, and I, I, I'm going to, in a minute, in, in invite a colleague of mine, um, uh, Barry Truax from uh, uh, Communications at SFU, uh, to come up to uh, introduce um, uh, our performer this evening, Andrew Zink. Um, but um, just to, by way of a, you know, uh, a, a short introduction of, of what, what we'll be seeing um, uh, unfold tonight, um, it's, it's a a particular pleasure, as I was saying, to have uh, a performance and, and to really think about the nature of performance, the, to think a little bit about the theme of the, of the performance, which is improvisation. I think in, in, this, in, in the times that we're facing today, um, it's really crucial to foreground um, the role of art and aesthetics uh, philosophical and conceptual discussions um, in and of themselves as ways of addressing our, our crisis because um, I think that nothing speaks more of our crisis than attempt to marginalize and ultimately um, reduce to rubble uh, these um, very intrinsic dimensions of um, uh, of, our, uh, of our own humanity, of our own sociality, uh, of our uh, own um, uh, ways of uh, understanding our, 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 our common social relations. So just a couple of things ab about Andrew. I, I, I have to say that um, first and foremostly, I'm uh, his senior supervisor. It is a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor to be um, uh, so. Uh, there's the truism that, that supervisors and teachers in general learn from their students. Um, but uh, never has this been more the case than, than with Andrew. I've learned a, a tremendous amount uh, from him about music and about performance. Um, and my favorite memory of, uh, of him is when he took my course on Nietzsche, I think it was 2005. Um, I, I did an evening seminar uh, on, uh, on the thought of Friedrich Nietzsche. And Andrew did a, prof uh, a presentation on the Tristan Chord and its importance for Wagner and Wagner's importance for Nietzsche. And it was something I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. I, I, I talk about it even uh, um, uh, today um, uh, with, uh, with colleagues and, and, and other students and, and, and friends. It was wonderful. So this is something we've been looking forward to. And by we, I mean Andrew's committee, who are all here. Barry will come up in, in a second. He's um, on uh, Andrew's PhD. Uh, committee, uh, as is Laura Marks, who's here in, in the audience. We're very um, anxious to see the performance, to hear him speak about his work, and then also we're going to carry this on afterwards and have a little bit of a meeting and discuss his, his work. So this is both a little bit of um, business and, 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 and pleasure. So um, very much hope you enjoy the evening. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. And um, uh, at this point, I'll just invite um, Professor Barry Truex to come up and um, provide a more fulsome introduction of Andrew. Well, thank you, thank you all for coming on, on behalf of uh, Andrew. It's a great pleasure to introduce him. I think the reason I was asked is not just the committee, but uh, Andrew has been a student, friend, and colleague for almost 40 years. Uh, of course, that meant he was a child prodigy when I first <laughs> met him. Uh, but, uh, and, and for most of that period, all three at the same time. So it's multifaceted and has been uh, very rewarding. Um, I suspect that um, most of you who come at, to this through the uh, uh, Liberal Studies Program and the Institute for the Humanities know him as uh, from the intellectual side, from the academic side, as having a keen intellect and acumen for ideas and um, Probably uh, we could say he has an unceasing zest for research and thought and extending all of the above 
in an amazing uh, kind of way. But it's possible, although I see some musicians in the crowd here, that you may not know him as a composer and performer. And tonight is a wonderful opportunity, as has been alluded, to uh, hear at least the performing part of it, which is really the composing part of it. And I'll, I'll come back to, to that in a minute. So I'm just going to, if you'll indulge me, this is also a pleasure for me because I haven't heard him uh, perform for quite a few years and that probably has a little bit to do with holding down a full-time job at the Art Institute and doing a master's degree and a PhD degree now in process and uh, being a founder of Earsay Records and all kinds of things I probably don't even uh, know about. Uh, it's uh, Oh, and also a gourmet chef, it must be remembered, that the sensory appetite uh, <laughs> extends in many different ways uh, in, in this. Uh, the cliche would be the Renaissance uh, person, and, uh, but it is a cliche, but boy, I think Andrew comes very close to being exactly that kind of ideal as, as being extremely broad and yet uh, deep at the same time. I'm going to just indulge a little bit in uh, some things about the musical background and the way that I interacted with him as a composition and teacher uh, at, at SFU. I recall, of course, with apologies if I get some of the details wrong, but the way the memory goes, um, I remember him uh, coming into my life uh, probably in the early 80s or something in a, a event that, we, uh, that I organized for quite a few years called the Computer Music Weekend. He was interested or fascinated or something. Anyway, he showed up for, <laughs> for computers. Well, at that time, like, I was about the only game in town in terms of computers and music. As hard as that is for the youngsters in this place to think of that music and computers, like, you know, it wasn't something that everybody had and, and knew anything uh, about. So, uh, and then, of course, he took courses uh, at uh, SFU, particularly in contemporary arts and uh, had developed very quickly uh, an expertise in music and technology, right, which of course exists to this, this day. And then I have to say that around the year 2000, um, he suddenly shows up in my computer composition class 20 years after the last class that I'd had with him. Now he did, to be fair, he did give me a forewarning so that I wouldn't die of a heart attack or feel like Rip, Winkle, uh, Rip Van Winkle waking up 20 years ago and nothing had changed, right? Uh, it turned out that he actually hadn't in his, uh, his, his uh, quest for uh, everything, interests, uh, he hadn't actually finished the mundane bachelor's degree. Oh yes, that's right, uh, a few credits short or something like that. So here you have now, in the early 2000s, you have a mature composer and, and performer and audio uh, expert teaching the subject at the, what it was called, the Center for Digital Media and the Arts or something like that. And uh, so, of course, in a computer music, under, you know, fourth year computer music composition class, I think I ended up premiering his projects at international festivals and everybody thought this was really good stuff, right? I think you could say he aced the course, right, for, uh, at, at that point. So, and then of course, now, at that point, a critical uh, change happens. He's performing, he's composing, and he's teaching, and basically he's already a well-respected uh, professional in all respects. So, of course, you would think that if he needed or wanted to do postgraduate work right at this stage, he would do it in music and technology. <coughs> ah, no, not so fast, world. <laughs> Andrew then took on the task of moving into the humanities and mastering uh, classical literature, philosophy, and uh, unbelievable range of uh, topics at that point in the liberal studies program, which happened to be very welcoming to mature students, right, which I think SFU should be eternally uh, grateful and recognize for, uh, for allowing mature students because it's certainly uh, their experience adds a great deal uh, to the whole learning, teaching and learning experience as has been alluded to. And now, of course, fearlessly embarking on a uh, PhD program. Well, the performer aspect, even if it's been maybe a little muted over the last few years, is so central to uh, Andrew's thesis, right? Because the real-time improvisation that he does on the piano uh, is a, the perfect example of his thesis topic, which is about the embodied listener, musician, performer, because he's the listener, performer, and composer are all intimately integrated. In fact, I can't imagine how it could be more integrated in a very dynamic way, moment by moment by moment, 
throughout the entire uh, process. Now, improvisation is not necessarily you know, new in, in that respect. There's a long tradition. I won't bore you with a lecture on that. But you know, when you think of great improvisers in the jazz tradition, uh, Bill Evans or, say, uh, Keith Jarrett, you can hear in their amazing uh, variations and, and, and output the, uh, the classical music language being reinvented on the spot, right? Uh, the language is basically there and you're amazed by how they, they weave it into novel kinds of things. I think there's something more going on here with, with Andrew. Uh, first of all, it's, it's certainly not based on conventional harmony. It's uh, based on, well, you'll see gestures and textures and, and repeated things. I used to kind of give him an inside compliment joke of that I thought his speed reached granular proportions, which means where there's more events per second than you can actually individually perceive. <laughs> okay? And we'll just check him out to see whether that technique has is, is, is also matured <laughs> over the years. In other words, there's a density and intensity. And of course, if you know uh, Andrew personally, you know that this is totally reflective of the energy of his personality. How could it be otherwise? But it does exactly now uh, it, it, it be important for us to have this experience, particularly coming from basically an academic uh, framework of, of, of most of you in this program in particular, to hear what, and see and experience what it actually means, right? Not just theoretically, but uh, so we can say now there's an auto-reflexive aspect of this, uh, auto-ethnography if you want, but I think it's more a re reflecting and being informed. I'm, I'm a big fan of theory and practice, right? Although I take it a little more sedately <laughs> with time to reflect, right, uh, on it. And I might also want to throw in a reference of the other integration on a not quite so intense level would be the sound walk, all right, where the listener, performer, composer are one and the same in the audience, right? So this is clearly the opposite of the traditional Western view of source, medium, and, and, and end result of composer, performer, score worked in there, and then performance, and then a, a listener, right? These are all collapsed into one. And they are collapsed so strongly into one uh, with Andrew, I can hardly think of any other performer, composer for which that is uh, true. And then the intriguing question is, what will he make of that in an academic thesis uh, context? And how will the experience and the reflectivity uh, go back and forth? And you may be able to experience that yourself. So this is a great treat for me, and I'm, I'm sure it will be for all of you tonight. So without further ado, Andrew. Thank you, Barry and Samir, for that. That was almost embarrassing, but uh, thank you. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I was trying to think about how to start this off, and uh, it really is a, a, a sort of an uncommon uh, event. Uh, and it started really, uh, Samir and I talking uh, quite a while ago, and I, I think I was complaining mostly uh, about the difficulty, the difficulty of, um, of presenting about uh, going to conferences and presenting about music because conferences, uh, academic conferences, expect you to speak. And they don't really, they're not really set up for anything else. So even, even getting sound systems in to, you know, to play recordings, even that was like this epic logistical issue uh, where I'd get, you know, substandard sound systems and just these, you know, <sighs> things that made me sigh a lot. Um, and, and, and I'm not really talking about uh, recordings is the thing. I'm talking about performance, as uh, Barry was pointing out. So anyways, I was <laughs> some here and I were going on about that, uh, you know, because I was musing on the idea of asking a conference, you know, when I send in my technical comments, oh, grand piano. Yeah, I haven't tried that actually. Anyway, Samir, who is not afraid of doing things unconventionally, um, jumped on it and said, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's bring a piano and let's, uh, let's hear you talk and let's hear you perform in the same, uh, same event. Uh, so I'm very, uh, very excited about that. Um, so what I'll do, the way we'll run this is I'm going to sort of talk about what I've been doing with the PhD research. Um, it'll take half an hour or so. I'll try to sort of outline things uh, in general terms and what interests me and what I think is really cool about performance and composition uh, and all that. Um, then we'll, we'll take a brief break so you can get more beer or whatever you like to drink um, so I can get a sip as well. And then uh, I have a new piece 
uh, called Torrent Trickle uh, that I'll be, this is the first time I'm playing in public. Uh, it's been between 30 and 40 minutes for the last several weeks, so give or take somewhere in there. So it's the largest solo piano thing I've, uh, I've ever done, actually. Um, I like where it's gone. I'm actually very pleased with it. So I'm very happy to, uh, to present that today. Okay, so the, the full title of uh, tonight's uh, event is Torrent Trickle, the exploratory and the performative in doing music. Okay, and it says doing music, not just music. Okay, because I want to draw our attention to uh, and focus on the fact that music is an activity and not a thing. It's something we do. Uh, Christopher, Christopher Small pointed out that the word music should be thought of as a verb rather than a noun. According to him, when we're doing music, we're musicking. Musicking is a form of action. I like this. I've adopted it. This is now part of my vocabulary. The concept of music in European and New World cultures uh, has become reified, and so the word music became a noun in that process. So if we look back to the evolutionary origins of musical activity, we can reasonably conclude that music initially consisted in improvised performance. Uh, in many cultures and practices, it still does. In the West, however, music notation developed, uh, gradually changing an oral tradition to a literate one. Uh, notation was initially intended as a mnemonic device to remind the musician of the contour of a melody. This became much more intricate over the centuries uh, to what it is uh, today. There's a lot of details in there uh, that we won't talk about. Music became a work that was inscribed in a score. Eventually, this score became the ultimate definition of the music work, and performances were evaluated in relation to fidelity to the score. Musicking became reified into the work and further reified into the notated score. And this has become deeply embedded on our language. I've heard musicians, and myself included, not anymore, but uh, myself included, often to refer, refer to a sheet music to scores as the music. This is really bizarre if you think about it. The abstraction of the score has become more real than the music as performed. So embodied sonorous musical practices are forces of de-reification. Right? Musical scores have developed in a way that valorizes attributes of music that lend themselves to notation, typically pitch and duration, otherwise known as notes. Scores are unable to notate everything that take place, takes place in a musical performance, so the idea of the note itself is an abstraction. The note, through its inscription in the score, has become the functional unit of music in the West. I believe that gesture is more fundamental to music than the note. Gestures are what performing musicians make when they are doing music. The gesture may be abstracted into smaller units after the fact, but I don't believe that this is where the musical impulse begins. A melody, for example, is not just a sequence of notes, something that hangs together in a melody. It's a form of gesture and has a sense of unity or identity to it. It's nuanced in a way that a score cannot capture or convey. There are many forms of embodied sonorous musical practices across cultures and throughout history. Uh, all forms of improvisations, any, any kind of improvisation, uh, Indian classical music, Javanese gamelan music, Japanese taiko drumming, and of course popular and folk forms of music are examples uh, of music that are not dependent on a score. These are oral and sonorous traditions that are focused on sound making and listening as their primary activity. These are gestural performance traditions. The disciplined labor of both performance and of listening is a major defining aspect of such traditions and practices. Traditional practices, or what we may call the habitus after Pierre Bourdieu, uh, pass on knowledge through dis disciplinary practices as taught by ac accomplished practitioners, our teachers. These are performative practices where knowledge of the tradition is passed on from generation to generation. Teachers take great care in ensuring that their students learn the tradition correctly before they are to be considered peers. There's a great weight and expectation in absorbing and mastering these traditional practices. While the force of tradition as disciplinary practices is strong, innovative new practices always develop. I propose a spectrum of musical practices ranging from those that primarily preserve tradition, which I am calling performative practices, to those that primarily overturn tradition in innovative ways, which I call exploratory practices. We can place different traditions and practices along this performative exploratory spectrum. No practice is fully one or the other. 
Even the most conservative traditional practice has a small exploratory aspect. For example, scored European classical music leaves room for the performer to interpret the score while still remaining faithful to it. Conversely, the most experimental free improvisation relies on tradition to some degree, at least in the training and mastery of the performer's craft. Exploratory practices are deterritorializing forces, establishing new resonance and attunements that deviate from the habitus, from the tradition. So what kind of an action or practice is musicy? Okay, in my view, there are four uh, important aspects to characterizing what musicing is. So first thing, musicing is a situated performative practice. It's done in a particular historical, cultural, geographical, and aesthetic milieu. And here, the concepts and words that we may take for granted regarding music are also situated. The work concept, according to Lydia Gurr, emerged around the year 1800. It's fairly modern. Western classical music since then has revolved around the idea of the musical work as central. And this marginalized oral, oral, improvisational practices while valorizing composition primarily as a score-based literate practice. And I should just interject here. I'm sort of, it sounds like I'm slamming uh, scores and, and composing like that. I, I'm not, it's not uh, evil, I, I do it myself. Um, so I'm just trying to show the, you know, uh, address the different kind of uh, forces and dynamics in these different ways of approaching it. Huh? So I say that musicking is a performative practice. Uh, what is performative about performing music? So I'm using the term performative in the sense that Judith Butler articulates it uh, regarding the performance of gender, for example. When we're performing music, we are, at least to some extent, performing the inherited tradition. In classical music, the tradition is tied to musical works as inscribed in scores. In folk music practices or other non-notated oral practices, the tradition is tied to embodied practices as passed on through demonstration. I've been taiko drumming. Some of you know that I've been taiko drumming for the last couple of years. Uh, they talk about notation, but they don't, there's nothing written down. The notation is, is verbal. It's different sounds and syllables that you make uh, to describe the different type of, types of drum strokes. And that's how you learn it. You, you, learn, you sing it, and then you learn to do the drum sto strokes. And uh, no score uh, involved. It's kind of cool. Anyways. Second point is uh, musicking is an embodied practice. It depends on the particularities of our embodiment, meaning all of our senses, both the traditional exteroceptive senses, sound, uh, sight, taste, smell, and touch, uh, as well as the less often discussed interoceptive or haptic senses, so the proprioceptive, the vestibular, the kinesthetic. Um, um, Embodiment has not traditionally been considered by philosophers and musicologists as central to musical practices, even though some of these practices are overtly embodied. Even the breaking down of human experience into sense mis modalities is kind of misleading. We don't really have sensations of tones and so on. We hear things, we hear things. With music, again in the Western classical tradition, the note is generally considered the smallest functional unit of music. Maybe, maybe not. Certainly in a score it is. In contrast to the performative, to performing the habitus, absorbing the tradition through the adoption of particular disciplinary practices is the exploratory. Because surely not all musicians are simply regurgitating or maintaining a tradition. Most of my friends aren't. The question arises, of course, as to how is it possible to enact exploratory behavior when we've been so deeply disciplined by the habitus of our training? Are we not doomed to perform the habitus in perpetuity? Clearly, that's not the case. But the question remains as to what allows us to transgress the habitus. It is the fact of our embodiment itself that provides access to pursue the exploratory. From the neonatal and even prenatal stages, we've been engaging bodily, uh, bodily with our world. We adjust our actions and alter our behaviors based on sensorimotor interaction with our environment. All of our actions have an exploratory aspect to them, even when undergoing the discipline of musical training. Even then, we are exploring what we, as embodied beings, are able to do. Movement and gesture are key to this ability. Dance scholar Carrie Nolan states that, uh, quote, gesturing is evaluative, a form of perception, adaptation, and creation, as well as a programmed routine and operating chain. 
end quote. She refers to Marcel Mauss's uh, notion of gesture as a technique of the body to develop her argument of what she terms gestural performatives uh, in contrast from J.L. Austin's uh, discursive performatives, referring to language. She suggests that gesturing is, um, uh, gesturing is the visible performance of a sensorimotor body that renders that body at once culturally legible and interoceptively available to itself. The hold the habitus has on our embodied being is never complete because our gestural actions and the specifics of the forms of discipline we've undergone never extinguish the possibility that we may revert even subtly to previous programs of embodied behavior or develop new ones. This provides a form of resistance to the habitus that may be consciously mobilized. Because we're engaged with the world through our sensor motor apparatus, we're continuously adapting and attuning ourselves to changing situations and so again, we may deviate from the discipline of the habit is either consciously and deliberately, unconsciously, or even through error in attempting to negotiate a new situation. Third point, music is a cognitive, prosthetic, and exploratory practice contributing to our knowledge of the world. I owe a lot here to um, uh, the inactive cognition approach or the inactivist uh, cognition uh, started really pioneered, I think, by Francisco Varela, uh, Evan Thompson, and uh, Eleanor Roche in the early 90s. And uh, several people have been uh, uh, taking that further, uh, Evan Thompson uh, particularly. I'll be quoting from him a lot. Uh, I quite like how he... Uh, he, he deals with this. So uh, what the inactive approach is, it's quite complex and far ranging, it's a big story, um, but I would like to bring um, attention to two of its main tenets. So firstly, uh, that quote, cognition is the exercise of skillful know-how in situated and embodied action. And secondly, that a cognitive being's world is not a pre-specified external realm represented internally by its brain, but a relational domain enacted or brought forth by that being's autonomous agency and mode of coupling with the environment." End quote. Our mode of coupling with the environment is an intentional one of active exploratory engagement through movement and touch and other sensorimotor interactions. The phrase mode of coupling means not only that phenomenal phenomenality is world presenting, it is also self-involving. Uh, and is an appearance of something for someone. Our mode of coupling is perspectival and intentional, and we maneuver through the world by moving and exploring it. And I'm quoting Thompson again, we need to reject the dualism between a self-contained mind and a mindless world. The subjective is not inside the mind and the objective is not outside it, end quote. We actively attune ourselves to the world and resonate with it through intentional engagement. It's through movement and gesture that we do so. Gesture, especially those that have developed into, uh, quote, fluent, skilled activities, um, uh, they direct our primary embodied engagement with the world, and it is because of this that we feel ourselves to be both in and part of the world. This is uh, L. Uh, Mennery. Uh, physical gestures are elements of the cognitive process. Andy Clark considers gestures and thought as a coupled system. The role of gesture, according to Clark, is to, quote, materialize one's own thought. While he uses examples uh, in his work focused on speech and writing, it's only a short step to adapt this idea to embodied musical practices, particularly those of improvisation. So rather than writing for thinking, where the writer is working out the thought while writing, we could say playing for thinking instead. Improvisers, in not pre-planning what they will play, work out the musical thought, the emerging real-time composition using their instrument. It's through touching the instrument, through the corporeal and tactual concreteness of the gestural contact between improvisers and their instrument that the emerging composition gets worked out. The instrument, through gesture, becomes part of the musician's cognitive process because their musical thinking depends on the agency of the instrument. The physical gesture as a material carrier, a physical materialization that has systematic cognitive effects, meaning that the actual motion of the gesture itself is a dimension of thinking. The hand is fundamental to gesture. 
and particularly musical gesture for the, from the performer's perspective. Musicians engage with their instruments primarily through their hands. The hand and brain are a dynamic system that reaches into the world. Through touch, grasping, manipulating, and gesture with and through the musical instrument, the musician thinks the music, develops the music through hand and body actions that shape our, shape our cognitive processes. Sean Gallagher speaks about uh, anarchic hand syndrome, where the hand seems to have a mind of its own. I like that. It made me laugh. I've certainly experienced this, and I'm confident that many uh, improvising musicians would say the same, where the emerging music during improvisation is as much about the tactual experience, about bodily posture, gesture, and so on, as of concerns with conscious attention to formal musical issues, you know, notes and harmonies and rhythms and things like that. The feedback loop produced in such circumstances is intriguing and often compelling in its exploratory action, a manual and pragmatic form of thought. Uh, Radman says, hands are not faithful to the purposive mind. I agree. This preconceptual engagement through gesture with the instrument contributes to the creative process as the music emerges under the hand and affects us in unforeseen ways. Radman again, the manual uh, possesses imagination in the fingers that produces marvels the thinking mind could never fully preconceive and words can hardly express. It could well be that under the fingers products emerge that stimulate thought and nourish imagination in a way that thought and imagination by their own means alone could never achieve." End quote. The phrase reaching toward is the etymological origin of prosthesis and resonates with Gallagher's statement uh, before there. Uh, this depth of neural integration is at the heart of, uh, of prosthesis. Practicing and develop developing skillful use of the hands results in plastic changes to the brain. According to uh, George Herbert Mead, the hands define a space around the body he called the manipulatory area. Technologies in the case of musical instruments, in this case musical instruments, provide an opportunity to expand this manipulatory area. The neural integration of hand and brain is not limited to the boundaries of our physiology, but extends to our instruments. Prosthesis calls into question the boundary limits of our body. Bernard Stiegler states that, quote, there can be no gesture without tools outside of the body and constituted, constitutive of its world. He calls this a putting outside of self, but one that questions the distinction between interiority and exteriority. He suggests that we cannot have one without the other, and that, in fact, to uh, quote Stiegler here a, a bit at length, this interiority is nothing outside of its exteriorization. The issue is therefore neither that of an interiority nor that of an exteriority, but that of an originary complex in which the two terms, far from being opposed, compose with one another. Neither one precedes the other. Neither is the origin of the other, the origin being then the coming into adequacy or the simultaneous arrival of the two. A prosthesis does not supplement something, does not replace what would have been there before and would have been lost, it is added. The prosthesis is not a mere extension of the human body, it is the constitution of this body as human. It is not a means for the human, but its end." End quote. It's our practices more than our technologies that are prosthetic. Our prosthetic practices integrate technologies, objects, into our own bodies, ourselves. With musical instruments, we're able to produce sounds that we could not otherwise make. We modulate our environment, our culture, ourselves and others with our musicking. But in this process, we are also modulated by the agency of our instruments. Musical instruments exert agency over us, affect us, by requiring us to move in particular ways to master them, and to listen in particular ways to understand their potential, our potential. The agency of musical instruments imposes an evolving dis disciplinary practice on the musician, which alters what the body can do, which then further modulates or perturbs the disciplinary practice itself in an ongoing feedback loop. This shows again that musicking is an inactive ecological process. Through our prosthetic actions, we bring forth and modulate our world. We are not isolated bodies situated in a pre-given environment, 
but rather we are affective forces of articulation in the places that we inhabit. We are, or become, because of both our bodies and those of others. Fourth point, four of four. It's a sonorous, music is, musicking is a sonorous practice in that the primary result of musical practices is the creation and or articulation of sound. This should be obvious. I don't know if it is. And for me, by sound, I mean that in a wide inclusive sense, and not just certain aspects of the sound like pitch and duration, which Western music has made dominant, but everything that can be heard and potentially including all of the sounds an instrument or instruments can make. Sounds like the noise of hammer contacting the strings in a piano. Normally, we, uh, it, or traditionally, the sound is ignored or marginalized as a necessary evil and uh, not part of the compositional music, uh, music making process. Um, I've, I've you know, adopted and embraced the noise of hammers. I like the noise of hammers. Sound is the result of a collision of forces of an encounter. Sound waves literally physically strike our bodies. And in this encounter, the body of sound in its collision with us affects us. Going to Spinoza, the Spinozan body, the body whose capacity to affect and be affected is the body whose abilities are increased or decreased as it is affected. Sound's force, its sonority, is a powerful affect machine to uh, you know, uh, channel uh, my inner Deleuze. Uh, musical sound is able to prime us to perceive things that may have gone unnoticed before. It can entrain us to be in synchronization with our world, with our bodies, with other bodies. Music renders sonorous. Embodied performative forms of music do so in particularly tangible ways by engaging the body through movement, orality, and tactility. Music both renders the sonorous by enacting and articulating, articulating that which is already sonorous, and also renders sonorous that which is not. Duration, intensity, intimacy, longing, fear, hope, desire, delirium, hysteria. Music provides a unique way of performing knowledge while exploring the world through attunement. It is the body that hears, not just the ears. We use our bodies to attune ourselves to the sound and feeling of music. Flisser, Willem Flisser said, in listening to music, the body becomes music and the music becomes a body. Flisser elaborates on the unique nature of music, musical experience. He points out that because sound consists of vibration in air that strike us, we resonate in attunement with it. Resonance is based on harmony between the dimensions of the body and its individual parts and the wavelengths of sound that are colliding with it. Again, the Spinozan body, a body made up of smaller bodies in composition being affected and transducing the vibrations of musical sound, not only into nerve activity, but also into thoughts, dreams and ideas, desires, joy, longing. In listening to and performing music, the body, the self, becomes music, becomes other by attuning itself. Embodied, sonorous musical practices are prosthetic, reaching towards a place, a person. It is at least potentially an ecstatic experience, a standing outside of oneself, where the skin, the whole body, transforms from a boundary into a connection. Let's wrap things up and conclude some of my thoughts here. So our experiences take place through and with our senses. Musicking is no exception, and we can see that it is the result of a collision between forces, initially of physical forces producing sound, and also a collision between affective forces between bodies. We're directly affected by the forces of musicking as they articulate and intensify our experience of musical sound. Natural forces, or as Elizabeth Gross puts it, uh, the forces of space, time, and materiality affect our bodies and perhaps reconfigure or reorganize them in powerful transformational ways. Gross continues by stating that her interest is in addressing, uh, quote, how these forces cohere to enable the productive explosion of the arts from the provocations posed by the forces of the earth, with the forces of living bodies, by no means exclusively human, which exert their energy or force through the production of the new and create, through their efforts, networks, fields, territories that temporarily and provisionally slow down chaos enough to extract from it something not so much useful as intensifying 
a performance, a refrain. Art in general, and music in particular, organize their materials in a way that impacts bodies. As elaborated before, musicking is a prosthetic practice, one which reaches toward. It's about contact, impact, collision. It is subjective and intersubjective at once. By configuring and reconfiguring the materials of musicking, we generate meaning and knowledge that is impossible to separate from the particular form the aesthetic imagination has given them. Affect and concept are linked, and together, the artist is able to distribute or redistribute the sensible, to uh, refer to Jacques uh, Rancier, uh, what can be heard and what is silenced. Articulating this, Adorno said, and this is my favorite Adorno quote right now, Adorno said that, uh, quote, art is the most drastic argument against the epistemological separation of sensuousness and understanding. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. So whoever said he was a cranky old guy, I don't know. I don't know. I think you got that right. Maybe he was cranky sometimes. Uh, in musicking, from both the performer's and listener's perspective, uh, performance and listener's experience, sorry, the musical experience is articulating a framing of the forces of the earth in a way uh, that, uh, to quote uh, Sherry Nicholson, uh, alters the experiencing subject, literally shaking the subject out of its distance from the work and its contingency to a shattering extent where the subject experiences himself as taken beyond the limits of subjectivity. End quote. The contact... Uh, the impact of colliding elemental forces is at the root of musicking. The interaction of these forces affects subjects. It is social, it's ethical, and it's political. Musicking, as an affect machine, mobilizes experience in the encounter of musical sounds and forces, thereby transforming its subjects. Musicking may be thought of as an affect modulation technique, to quote Brian Misumi. These techniques are activated during the musical event uh, through reflex, habit, training, and the uh, use of skills. Masumi uh, continues stating that the habitus of training is, quote, the necessary foundation for improvisation. You can only effective imp effectively improvise on the basis of elaborate forms of inactive knowing that operate with all of the automaticity of a second nature. Affect can be modulated by improvisational techniques that are thought and felt into action, flush with the event. Since it modulates an unfolding event on the fly, it cannot completely control the outcome, but it can inflect it, it can tweak it. It is directly participatory at no distance from the event under modulation. It is the tweaking of an arc of unfolding on the fly. It can amplify, resonate, or even bifurcate and keep restructuring keep the structuring alive. This is not a rationality, it's an affectivity, redolent with thought, flush with action." End quote. Musicking articulates the sensorium and powerfully affects, affects the participating subjectivities. This has the potential of establishing new relationships and transforming traditional ones in ways that can be either liberatory or dominating. It can either increase or decrease our ability to affect and be affected. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I think what we'll do next, I want to just make a few comments about my musical practices, just for those of you who aren't familiar, and uh, then we'll maybe take a couple of minutes and uh, get a, a, a beverage and then I'll present uh, Torrent Trickle, if that sounds okay. Um, I have several streams of uh, musical activity. Um, I do solo piano, of course, that's where I, that was my first instrument. I've been playing piano for 49 years now. Well, uh, so uh, it's kind of like breathing or eating or living. It's just sort of part of it. Um, I have worked a lot with small ensembles, often in improvisatory uh, environments, but I've also done more traditional composing of things. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, electroacoustic, uh, particularly acousmatic um, uh, work as well. And what I'm focusing on here, of course, is improvisational live performance work. And uh, we'll focus on the solo, uh, solo piano here. Um, the work I do, I, ca I call it uh, structured improvisation. 
uh, that sits somewhere in between improvisation or free improvisation and composition. Um, I usually develop my work from you know a free improvisation standpoint uh, in that I just sit down and start doing things without really thinking about it. Uh, and then things sort of emerge. I sometimes record them, not always. Uh, but I sort of reflect on it then, right, which is sort of the compositional process and uh, decide, you know, certain things interest me and I'll focus on those. Other things I'll reject or, or just set aside for a different project or something like that. And gradually I'll sort of hone it down and build it into this, this thing uh, that has uh, some sort of recognizable identity uh, in that the, um, you know, the materials and maybe the processes are composed or prearranged, uh, but all of the details, all of the articulations, uh, the working out is unforeseen uh, until the actual, uh, the actual performance. So as I mentioned before, I've been uh, working on this for a few months now. Uh, the last couple of weeks I've been timing the performances, and they've been be between 30 and 40 minutes. So, you know, it's not like working a Beethoven sonata where maybe you, you know, you're, uh, you know, a couple of minutes, you know, here or there, depending on how you approach things or interpret things. It's, it can be quite uh, massive. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens tonight. <laughs> you know, no guarantees, but uh, there we go. Anyway, thank you for your attention. If we can maybe just, yes? Yes, that'd be great. Uh, let's just, uh, yeah, take a couple of minutes. All right, torture.
shortage of, uh, of time to, to keep uh, questions and comments as concise as possible. So. Simple question. Yes. Do your motifs stay the same? Uh, yes. And do you ever use traditional notation in this process? Yes. <laughs> Very rarely. Uh, it's yeah. sort of hard. But I do sometimes figure out, you know, motifs and themes and things that I like to come back to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do occasionally write those down. But definitely not a full score. I, I, you know, I, just, I don't even want to think about that. Yeah, Dwayne? Um, oh, uh, Helena? Oh, yeah, that's um, in your talk, first you mentioned um, using the idea of prosthesis. And I'm interested in how that played into the composing, or the idea. Ah, yeah, that's, um, that's sort of an emerging process for me. Um, but, you know, having spent 49 years with this, um, it is not separate from me in any you know significant way you know uh, and I do work out I don't sort of imagine the things uh, you know full-blown like Mozart was supposed to and then just transcribe them I'd shoot myself from boredom if I had to do that um, it's working through it's working through it so it's really it's like an extension of my hands and my my whole be being my whole body you know um, and I think quite literally in a lot of ways, you know, without that sort of discipline over years and years and years, it's not kind of, it's not, it the instrument doesn't get integrated into your uh, makeup in the same way. I don't think I could, like I couldn't do this for violin. I couldn't do anything like that for violin or guitar or any other instrument that I haven't, that hasn't become sort of uh, entangled with my neural makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know your pieces from behind, but this one, in this particular improv, it seems that you were quite influenced by you playing the other instruments, especially like the cembalo and stuff, and I can feel that new approach and fresh approach to the piano yeah. that I haven't heard from you before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, definitely my years with, uh, with uh, Javanese gamelan, uh, I think, is you know, quite clear if you're familiar with that music. Um, even my you know, lap steel guitar playing to some degree, and the taiko drumming for sure, you know, although that was a natural, that was a natural <laughs> um, uh, sort of uh, uh, occurrence, I guess, for, for me. I've always uh, treated the piano as a very percussive instrument. I've uh, taken on Cecil Taylor's you know, famous uh, uh, description of the piano as 88 tuned bongos. Uh, he actually just passed away in April, so there was a little bit of a tribute to him in there with the uh, wild, wild clusters. Uh, yeah. Dwayne, did you have a...? Yeah. Um, in your talk, you mentioned something to the effect that uh, uh, improvisation can actually occur almost subconsciously in the movement, automaticity, if you will, of your fingers, for example. Are you how often do you consciously, are you aware that that's happening? Uh, yeah, that's tricky. When I become consciously aware of it, everything falls apart. Uh, <laughs> which has happened, you know, which has happened. Because I'm trying, you know, I'm working on this PhD. I think about things probably more than I should. Uh, so every once in a while, it, uh, it just sort of unravels. Uh, but that happens all the time. I actually notice that, not in as articulate a way. But, you know, in my teens, when I was learning to play jazz, um, just, you know, that we would do things. I mean, we'd always talk about the harmonies and this voice leading, that voice leading, but really a lot of time it was just your hand is here and you did this, you know? And, uh, and that became as, as good a reason to do something as, you know, working out some elaborate uh, chord progression or whatever. Yeah. Andrew, um, yeah. just about the habitus, that's a yes. central um, dimension of your, uh, of your argument. Yeah. That you're going to develop in pieces. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's so it, crucial in anchoring this. Uh, this, this kind of opposition, it's not really an opposition, but it's kind of tension uh, between the performer and the exploratory. Mm -hmm. um, are all habituses created equal? Mm -hmm. In terms of enabling or disenabling <laughs> exploration? This is why he's my senior supervisor. <laughs> um, I would say probably not. Um, I would say different habituses have different uh, agencies or different levels of agency. Uh, I'm just thinking about the, you know traditions and histories I'm familiar with, um, you know. So you get some very formal, um, strict disciplines 
uh, like you know the Western classical you know virtuoso musician uh, training, which is very you know it's 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 very it's overbearing, it's domineering, um, it's it's not always good, uh, and can uh, I think and I've seen this uh, and or rather heard this often enough that I think it kind of squishes the creativity and imagination out of people because it's so brutal. Whereas I find some uh, traditions are a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to say organic, but that's not really what I mean. But this sort of evolves uh, in less strict ways, maybe. You know? So some folk traditions and things like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll just tell you just quickly why I, I, I mm -hmm. raise this question. So I think it's a, a great answer. Mm -hmm. the, the, the question um, comes from uh, just thinking a little bit about Brett's uh, Life of Galileo, mm -hmm. where he shows, uh, at, at one point, Galileo talking to these Aristotelian philosophers who were representing the church. Um, uh, he shows them his prosthetic device, reaching out into, not the world, but into the universe. <laughs> into the right? center space. Uh, yeah. And they refuse. They yeah. refuse to reach out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so <laughs> what he's doing in using this telescope, um, and, and of course, Spinoza was the lens grinder. Yes. Um, <laughs> Is that he was he, he was in, essentially justifying mm. um, the Copernican revolution, saying yeah. that now we have definitive evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there is a kind of uh, then uh, dimension. Now you can see where I'm going. The, yeah. the, 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 you know, make it new comes out of mm -hmm. what Bloomberg calls the legitimacy of the Copernican age. And, right. and so this is something important here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah habits, all habits, this is aren't aren't created yeah. really in the sense. Yeah. So. Anyway, we can, yeah. we can talk more about this. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yes? Um, would you ever consider presenting this, or would you consider it suitable to present this in conjunction with a different media? Um, or would it be too contradictory to the spontaneity, the active nature of the performance? So, like, what are you thinking? Visual. I have visual bias. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'm not against that uh, at all. Um, uh, how to make it work is a separate problem. Um, I have worked with uh, filmmakers and media artists before, uh, and it's usually not that successful uh, because it's they feel I'm overbearing, uh, which I probably am. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not ashamed of that, but uh, uh, it's it's been always sort of a fraught uh, relationship. But I I like the idea, you know. And maybe with some uh, sort of newer immersive technologies, maybe this could work, you know, because you need, you know, the problem with the screen is it's sort of, you know, over there, whereas this is like, you know. Do you think the screen would have to be improvisational as well? That'd be cool. I don't know how to do that. Kind of like film thinking of like an artist. A dancer. <laughs> a dancer or an artist or someone who's some combination mm -hmm. of both like a virtual reality mm -hmm. where there's like multi-dimensions yeah. to work with. Yeah, I'm totally open to that. Um, let's do it. Um, I have worked with dancers and dancers, choreographers have worked with my music, one sitting in this room. Um, and I've, those, those uh, collaborations I have liked, those have worked for me. Uh, whereas the media screen based things just, like I say, we always ended up in this kind of you know, at, uh, at odds with each other. You know? yeah. Yes. Uh, I thought that was a totally awesome performance. Thank you. I, I've never heard anyone play the piano like that. <laughs> and I was particularly mm. impressed at the times when you were really um, at the really powerful loud parts where the piano was still reverberating on those notes and you're already playing some others. Yeah. <laughs> And yes. That, uh, <laughs> Thank that, you for noticing I, that. I don't think I'd uh, ever heard uh, yeah. anyone do that before. Yeah, this is sort of a, a, an ongoing long-term interest in resonance in general. The piano is a really big, weird, complex instrument. It resonates in very strange ways that I've gradually sort of figured out how to activate, uh, activate those things in different ways. And you can layer it. I mean, there's 88 of those things. You can layer stuff, you know, uh, you can really layer stuff and build up these uh, resonances uh, simultaneously. So it's almost like a... Uh, counterpoint of resonance. Mm -hmm. But you kept the sustain pedal down for, I don't know, minutes at the beginning. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It depends where, what you're doing, you know, but uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, when you're playing improvisationally, we all tend to go into certain rhythms, like three, four, four, four. Uh -huh. uh, how much do you think of that is naturally cultivated from your body's response to the music versus what we hear in pop culture that influences it? 
Yeah, that's a that's probably a good question. I think uh, you know I think um, the influence of uh, pop uh, media is uh, pervasive, you know. And I think if you uh, if you don't sort of think outside that, or if you're not exposed outside of uh, to something outside of that, I, I'm not sure. This is the habitus in uh, in sort of brutal force here, you know. I have another argument I didn't get into about genre as being this sort of stratification of history. Uh, and this kind of materialization of these certain types of practices, and it's hard to get out of. You can get out of it, people do all the time, but I think it's, you know, on average, you know, not, uh, not so much. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I guess there was 4-4 four, four and stuff in there, uh, not tons, you know. 7-8s, 13-8s, you know. Yeah, you know, I like non-square things uh, in comparison to, you know, against, uh, situated against square things. Sorry, I missed that, Alex. So is that Hungarian is normal? Uh, yeah, yeah. So is that a conscious decision to stray away from the even yes. time signatures when you're... Better believe it, yeah. Yeah, I, I like non-square rhythms a lot. I like square rhythms too, but I, I hear those all, all the time. Uh, so I like I like these non-square rhythms, and I've been playing some of those, like you know, seven, eight, thirteen, eight, for so long. Uh, you know, I can groove on them. You know, which is really kind of cool. Uh, I try some other things. It's harder to groove on at first, but you need to sort of get it under your under your skin. You know, uh, integrate it into your neural makeup. It just takes time. You know, there's no quick quick route to that. Yeah. Yes. I have one last question. Okay. <laughs> so, when you approach to the improv, how much is a reflex? How much is a narrative? None of it's a narrative. So um, I don't really. That, I'm not saying narrative is bad. I just don't think that way. Okay. Um, I've had people ask me to do that, and I I can. If I force myself into it, like I can real, I can do it, but I find it sort of unnatural. I don't, I don't know why exactly. Okay. I think very much in terms of sound and sonority and not so much in, yeah, I just, I don't know, I just oh, don't do that, yeah, for better or worse. Do you ever, once finishing a piece, reflect on it and develop some sort of almost emotional narrative to it? Rather than like a storyline in particular, but do you have like defined emotional reactions? Not really, it? yeah, not really. Mostly because they just change for me all the time. Like every time I play this, I feel quite different. You know? Does your wife feel differently? <laughs> You'll have to ask her. <laughs> I, I come from a dance background, so I see whole physical patterns. Yes, I, I, I experience it differently. Okay, what question? I've been so long now, I never asked this question. When you go and you sit down and you think, you know, well, whatever, however it comes out of you, what I'm not gonna define that for yourself, is it, Emotional, or is it an intellectual conversation? Like, are you coming from a place where you're, or are those two connected, and you can't have this conversation? It's pretty connected. Um, it's 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 probably initially more affective than rational, or th you know, uh, as I go, then I start thinking. It's like, oh, that, I, yeah, I did this kind of. What did I do there? Oh, I did this rhythm, and uh, it was this mode. Ah, oh, I should, you know, I should develop that. Uh, but it usually comes from kind of a feeling of something first. But as Adorno says, we can't separate sensibility. No, you really can't. And I love that quote. <laughs> love that quote. Yes, Laura. Uh, but si since you mentioned that uh, musicking is a machine for making affect, mm. you were referring to Masumi yeah. there. Yes. That really got me wondering. I mean, you're in this PhD, you're, stud you're studying your own response. Yes. Um, but that phrase, machine for making affect, yeah. usually refers to the listeners. Can you tell us? No? No, no, go ahead. Can you tell us yeah. something about the difference between the, uh, the affective response that you know, the music likely engenders in listeners, which is what we mostly think about when we think about music, and your affective response, well, your position also needing to maintain you know, intentionality and capacity? So, where, that's a long and complex question. Uh, where, where I'll say, no, no, that's great, I like that. Um, where I'll start is, is uh, first of all, um, yes, I think uh, you know, that's mostly referring to the listener. Uh, what I'm trying to do in this uh, research is you know, consider the performer as listener, 
you know, as composer, as improviser, as listener, you know, so the, you know, how the, you know, how the uh, performer l uh, has to listen. It's a, it's, it's a lot about, uh, about listening. So I'm really thinking about that. Um, the affect machine, uh, you know, I might just be seduced by the, the term, I like it, uh, but to me that it's, um, there's something machinic happens that's not fully under my control. Uh, there obviously there are things under my control and you know I've practiced and done all that stuff uh, but things emerge you know the anarchic hand syndrome and and all that um, so it's sort of entangled in a weird sort of way so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of not looking at what the listener is dealing with at this point although that's a, a good and interesting topic um, and most of the studies I come across on music are about listening, about what the listener experiences, you, and I just... You, you'd also say, wouldn't you, that the ideal listener is also a kind of performer? In, well, I'd say, you know, music. sure, absolutely. The listener is, the listener is also musicking. Well, yeah. Right. yeah. It's an active kind of yeah. role for yeah. listener as opposed to a competitive. Yeah. Well, certainly when you're, you know, attentively, actively listening, I think yeah. that happens when you're not distractedly uh, listening, for sure, yeah. And it is really, you know, it's you're trying to untangle these things, but ultimately, you know, it, it's this sort of weave of things that I can't quite pull apart. We will. <laughs> we will. Yes, John. Do you speak up quite a bit? It's hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I've, I've known your music for quite a long time, yeah. and the opening gesture um, brings us from a single sound that's quiet to as loud as possible so that we hear all of the noise and the complete spectral content of that single note. Yes. That posits that spectrum is essential to your practice. Yes. So when you go get through the course of this piece, during which I heard so many cultural associations, <laughs> uh, that it was like a free association happening. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you allow? Do you al just allow that to happen in your process? Yeah, I do actually, and I just sometimes notice and it like that. You don't pre-filter. You don't say, "Oh, that might sound a bit like tango, but I shouldn't do that," <laughs> or that might sound a no. Bit like I, so you know, so twenty years ago, I would have shut that down, right. but I don't. I don't do that anymore because I don't. I frankly don't care anymore. Because you, he heard the tango. He did. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I just. I've been studying tango for the past year. That, <laughs> that the way you move from the textural and the spectral mm -hmm. to the culturally associated yeah. is genius. Thank you. I just wanted to say yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, <laughs> I just want to add a note when I talk about the Anna narrative, what he said, you kind of created a subconscious narrative. Like every single of your piece is actually a story. I mean, I, I've known you for years, and if you actually close it up, it, it is a story. I mean. Especially when somebody Yeah, that's that's you musicking, Alex. Yeah, he is absolutely. That's your uh, part uh, contribution to the performance. Thank you for that. It's interesting to see how much of it is almost your narrative. To see like the the impacts of what you've been doing. Yeah, that's there. You could sort of pull that apart, I guess. It might even be interesting. It's not for me. I think we've pretty much. Nice to get your the idea is to leave them wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to leave you wanting more. Um, I want to thank you, Andrew. I, 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 I was very moved by that performance. It's incredible. And I feel tremendously humbled to be uh, with you. I really do. So thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> really, really, really great. I, I uh, uh, I'm so glad we've, we've got this. Uh, um, uh, filmed and it's been documented. Yes. Thank you all for coming and, and wonderful questions and comments, yes. by the way. Uh, it was a very knowledgeable audience, yep. obviously. Um, if you're interested in f further events uh, at the Institute of Humanities, please check us out. Um, we're all over the place. Website, <laughs> Twitter, you name it. Yep. We've got it. So, <laughs> thank, you. Have a good, thank you. Thank you.